The world of physicality and athletics has taught us so much about the mindset of men and women. And this is why we love watching our athletes perform at the highest possible level. We love to see the intentionality, the expression, and more. We like to see how they got there too. I'm loving this trend that we've been seeing in the last few decades inside of professional athletics, which is, yo, I'm just gonna stick around for really, really long. This is my chair, I know how to do it. I'ma sit in this chair in its well-worn grooves and perform at the highest level. That's right, longevity is taken over at the professional level. And so we're gonna do a little bit of a deep dive right here on this first word Monday. Ego killer motivation, thank you for listening. As we pour over the moves that our athletes take that you guys can eventually adopt to help you stay really, really active throughout your physical life. These start with your mindset, they have to do with strength and conditioning. They have to do with what you do with your technology, medicinal and wearable, and also, well, something that maybe you guys have thought about or heard about, performance enhancers. Yes, a lot of our professional athletes take performance enhancers. We'll talk a little bit of that right here today. We're going to maybe even talk about how you guys can think critically through the use of certain substances. Maybe that equates to you guys deciding to take supplements or not to take supplements at all. Maybe by the end of today's episode, you decide you don't even want to take supplements because of X, Y, and Z. I've trained people 80, 70, 60 long periods of time. It's the mindset with people like that. People like that are convinced inside their mind of a couple of things. Number one, they saw somebody in their family that wasn't doing so good once they hit 62, right? Let's face it. If you're 62 in 1993, physically, you look a lot different than being 62 in 2024, right? 62 in 1993, you watch like C-SPAN and then, you know, the TV guide is sitting nearby you get up and decide you're gonna write one of your, one of your friends a letter, and then get a response in two and a half weeks. Two people call you at the same time. One gets a busy signal. Dating's a little bit harder. You go. You want to work out. You want to work out, but you're just gonna be you're gonna be relegated. You're gonna be relegated to doing like a step class. Maybe you're not gonna have any other classes other than that. You do like a floor Pilates class or a cycling class. And that's pretty much it. Um, in 2024, well, damn, just think about all the variations that a 62-year-old can get. They can go ahead and do this dance. They could go ahead and do this weightlifting. They could go ahead and do this kettlebell class. We could go ahead for a running club and do that. We can actually participate in intramural sports. You could swipe right and left all you want to. The scene's changed in a lot of ways. You could go for a workout, take hella pictures in 2024, and you can have a whole conversation with the homies, some octogenarians, some not, and discuss that. And that is a huge, huge title shift. What I've noticed with people who are staying super active into their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, one thing is, oh, I watched my parents, and I don't want to end up like that. The other thing is just a mindset. As far as professional athletes go, you guys can adopt this too. There's been a shift in our strength and conditioning. There's been a thought shift, a paradigm shift. I love using the word paradigm. And it's showed that recovery matters so much. And while we get mad when we see professional athletes take a day off, take a week off, or whatever it is, is actually foundationally key to you guys staying super active inside the gym. If you keep grinding, keep pushing, you will burn out. Technology and recovery, like with medicine and surgeries, have a huge, huge role in the way that you guys move in the future. Types of surgeries, stem celling, PRPing, regrowing that cartilage, petri dishing, all of these things help to keep our athletes super active. Sometimes you guys have these types of surgeries and it keeps you even more active than before. And the last thing is substances. Yeah, a lot of our athletes are taking stuff. And a lot of it is undetectable. 
because these are designers. And because they're undetectable, they're getting away with taking stuff for much longer. A lot of the leagues, too, don't really want to pop these men and women for whatever substances they are taking. But the fundamental truth is the ineffable substances are being consumed. And because they're being consumed, we get to watch LeBron dunk. Not that I'm saying he's taking stuff. We get to watch Steph shoot all these damn threes way into his late 30s where that just wouldn't be the case. We'd see a precipitous decline in the way that these guys move. We're out here watching homeboy play football, the roughest possible sport. Yes, the roughest to play into his 40s, looking like uh, George Blanda or something. Anyway, if you don't watch football, you have no clue what I just said. <laughs> George Blanda was a football player for the Raiders. They trotted him out there in like the early 70s to be the backup and the kicker, but he was the starter in like the early 50s. Dude played until he was like in his 40s also, ended up just being a kicker. Point is, we're out here playing much longer. You know, they just had the roast of Tom Brady, right, the GOAT yesterday, and I didn't really watch any of it. I'm sure he lends himself to roasting in both ways. He seems to be able to handle um, taking a roast. For all his, you know, accomplishments and misgivings, he's a Bay Area guy, right? And we're used to having a diversity of opinions come our way. And so I ain't surprised that the guy's able to take something like that. But I remember sitting there training with uh, Marisol in the gym, her and her husband. And she told me, she goes, yeah, um, her heart throbbed Tom Brady, right? He's able, he said he was going to be playing, this is many years ago. Oh, he said he wants to play deep into his 30s and probably retire by the time he's 45. And I laughed. It was like one good hit, and that guy will be like, nope, fuck this. I don't need this anymore. No more. I'm done. Retire. So he can say everything he wants. And, man, I would, uh, man, I was completely wrong. Completely wrong. And that leads me, actually, to the first thing. It's the mindset. It's the mindset. The mindset that our athletes are having these days makes them want to play much longer than they think they could. Back in the day, it was probably perceived that once you reach 40, 38, you're done. You should just be done, done. Just finish it up. This is the case in fighting, in all of our ball sports. Once you get to like, four, in our rap game, once you get to 40, like Nas said, you know, 42 and in a karate class, and he's talking about Jay-Z, once you get to that age, you're done. And the mindset, the paradigm had to shift in our athletes. 40, 41, 42 is not the death sentence we thought it was. And we think in terms of physicality and we think high-level performance starts to precipitously decline after that. Well, maybe this is a function of a rationale that was born of just people not being taken care of themselves back in the day, right? Back in the 70s or whatever, when we saw athletes get to be 38 and their hair's thinning, right? And they're wearing goggles while they're playing golf or tennis. And they just looked old, right? All that great muscle mass that they amassed when they were in their 20s just starts to kind of fade a little bit. And we assume that, hey, they're old. They're a little bit slower. They're useless. It's a mindset shift. It's the same mindset shift that I've had when I've trained you guys, when I've trained a lot of my ex-clients that are deep into their 50s, into their 60s, past retirement age, and they're still being active. It's a mindset. I'm going to be here for the long haul. As long as there is oxygen to be taken in, I'm going to be training. Talking more about this, we can talk about how strength and conditioning has shifted along the way as well. Strength and conditioning now is focused on recovery and energy. That's it. That's it. That is all. Long time ago, it was focused mainly on building muscle, building as much muscle as you can. We talked about silly, silly troglodytic like caveman ideas, like if you lift weights, 
and you're like a baseball pitcher, the the weight distribution on your body is going to make you throw the ball weird. Or like if you have too much muscle and you're a basketball player, you're gonna you're not gonna be able to shoot free throws properly because it's just gonna your muscles are gonna take over. And we've let go of some of those dumb ass ideals because we understand about recovery. You guys know, right? My guy Leo Matveyev, the idea of periodization. I'm trying to keep you guys from burning out when you work out. When I know that you guys are lifting really, really heavy, I will slip in a suggestion. It'll be a suggestive suggestion that you guys don't lift super duper heavy multiple weeks in a row. Because what starts to build up is all of our, well, all of our byproducts signaling to our body. Recovery is needed. And the gains start to be deleterious. They start to be the opposite. And then the dreaded burnout starts to happen. And I could really set my watch to it. You guys lift super duper heavy for super duper long. What happens? Right? What happens when everybody started doing that CrossFit off the off top, you know, in the early 2000s, like 2005? Oh, that stuff makes you get all injured. You're always injured doing CrossFit. Why? Why do people say that? Because they met a lot of injured people. Now, does everybody get injured? Absolutely not. You're supposed to take breaks. But breaks aren't sexy. Breaks aren't built into a program. Um, They are now as well. They should be. But breaks weren't built into a program in such a way where you can say, hey, you guys should be lifting hard. Gut it out. And then go ahead and take a break and get yourself a pedicure. Put those cucumbers over your eyes for a week. Get massages. Thai massage. You know, have some 120-pound person walk on your back. Pamper yourself. Like, that doesn't sound hardcore, so nobody does it. But it it is and should be baked into any program. Even when I was training my fighters, right, before COVID, part of the training modality, the regimen, I should say, the programming, was kind of these unloading weeks where we didn't lift with our kettlebells, with our heavy weights. We did body weight, agility, stuff like that. Because that represents a lull in our muscle growth, giving us time to rebuild. Point being this. You guys out here lifting heavy day after day after day after day, you're going to burn out. And that burnout will represent a couple of things. Number one, it will rear its ugly head as injuries. Yep, all those little injuries that you guys like to shrug off time and time again, that's burnout, right? Remember where the, you woke up and like your neck is just on fire? Your neck's just on fire. You're like, oh, what happened? My pillow kicked my ass last night. It's that square pillow. It's got those sharp-ass edges. And the pillowcase that I was on, man, that thing, it's got the corduroy on it. That thing kicked my ass. Last- like, does that sound hardcore to you guys? It doesn't sound that brave to me. When you sleep really wrong, <laughs> right, and then your knee starts to flare up and fire up, That's indicative of what you might call an overuse syndrome. And those things have inroads into the way that you're using your body. where We're actually promoting just one movement pattern over another. That movement pattern we've figured out, oh, I got a good pain tolerance, but now my pain threshold is being reached. And guess what? I'm not going to be able to do the thing anymore. Then what happens too is your body goes, well, every time I do squats, my ankle starts to flare up again. Every time I walk around or I stand for a long period, my ankle starts to flare up again. Signs of burnout. Now you're not squatting anymore because your ankle hurts. And guess what happens to all of your squat numbers? Guess what happens to all your physicality? Starts to decline, doesn't it? That's your body's way of saying, chill, motherfucker. (laughs) You got to chill. Burnout. Another type of burnout is simply just straight up demotivation. Where you just feel like you're doing the same repetitive stuff over and over again. Think about it. If you're not excited to go out and hit your lifts to get those even marginal 1% gains. Because those are really important. Every time you're out in the gym. Maybe it's because we've hit that wall. Now if you've hit that wall, you're not looking for those 1% gains. There's very few people that I know who see that wall. And they're still pushing for gains. Usually those are people who are super 
knowledgeable about exactly how much weight they're lifting, how much rep count, how much time under tension. They're periodizing perfectly. They're almost following a program too strictly and haven't baked in recovery. And they are in this space where they're like, no, I know that I'm going to get a 1% gain, even though I hate doing my incline bench press, my arms hurt, my neck is stiff, and I just hate this gym. Every time I go here at 2 o'clock, I get bothered. I hate it. I don't want to go. Those are the only people that I know, and those are usually athletes, chronic lifters, and, and, and like trainees, coaches, athletes. Burnout. You just don't want to do it anymore. And if you don't want to do it anymore, you're not going to do it. And then what happens to your gains? Bye-bye. Right? That's what happens to your gains. You guys should be baked in, and you can find on my website, all right, CoachJohanCSCS.com. I have programs on there. I have PDFs on there that show you guys how to break down, especially in my course on CoachJohanCSCS.com, Conditioning for Competition. That whole course shows you how to set up a workout regimen where there is baked in time for you to recover. Very important. Guys, ideally, you can lift and work out indefinitely if you bake in rest and still get gains. Still get gains. In fact, that's one of the biggest secrets in the world for our, for our lifting and you want to put on some great muscle. You just got to keep showing up. But a lot of us have a lot of trouble doing that. Because we hit that burnout. So don't burn out, burn up. All right? Don't burn out, burn up. Burn in. Our athletes are also showing us that if you get some of that Kobe, some of those stem cells, some of that PRP, as I can attest to personally, that you might be able to do the impossible. That's right. You might be able to turn into an X-Men and regrow your own cartilage or something adjacent to it. When they stuck those three needles into my, or five needles into my shoulder, the doctor told me, like, it might regrow cartilage. I did a lot of my own reading, and I learned that it might regrow cartilage. But we all understand one thing. I think we've understood this now for decades, which is your cartilage goes away. It's gone. All right? Your cartilage is like that, the basketball. It's like the football. All right? You buy a football or a basketball specifically. You pull it out the pack. And it feels great. Why? Because it's got all those little dimples all over it. Those are your grips. You pull out that Rawlings, that Spalding, and you hit the court. And it's a fresh new basketball. It's got that grip. So important is this grip that in professional settings, they use a new ball as much as they... Whoop! Looks like the ball bounced in water for 0.7 seconds. Throw it away or give it to some kid. Here, take this fresh, professionally play, used ball that has like a millimeter of wear on it. I remember when I played, they'd talk about the tackified composite leather on the football. And this stuff was so grippy, you felt like Spider-Man. Then one of our uh, volunteer guys, uh, one of these ex-pros would come in and coach us on catching and running routes and he had the tackified gloves and he let everybody rub their finger on the tackified gloves and it was like sticking your finger in tar it's like yo how do you drop a football the football's made of the glove the gloves made of the football and i remember him making these just odell beckham jr catches one arm grabs and doing all this stuff and we were like whoa and yeah no real talk in two weeks multiple guys had those gloves they were dope. Why? Because the grip is what, you know, helped you look just cool. Once that grip goes away, it is gone. It's gone. Right? So you no longer look like Fred Bolitnikoff in 1971. The football becomes a greased pig. The basketball is slippery. And there is simply no way to add back grip onto the ball at all. No more tackified. It's gone. No more tacky tacky. And what that means inside of your body is once that cartilage is gone, it's gone forever. It's like the grip on your Rawlings. It's like the grip on your Spalding basketball. No way to add it back. PRP is potentially change that. My shoulder is 90% usable after being completely unusable because I don't have any cartilage on it. PRP 
we talk about all the surgeries that athletes get, whether it's Tommy John or whether it's some kind of knee replacement for ACL, MCL, where guys were at one point, people were getting cadavers, men and women getting cadavers of um, not like just pieces like an Achilles from a cadaver put into the knee. So your knee is now a foot. And what do you think happens when a knee turns into a foot? Well, that increases your chance for more injury and potentially makes it really hard to recover. Think about the compensation that happens inside your body when there is a tendon (laughs) designed to hold your entire body upright in your knee, which is just designed to hinge and flex your hamstring. Imbalances, and we've worked out in medical science. Here's the recovery process. Here's less invasive techniques. You don't need you know this, that, and the other. And this is a reason why so many of our athletes are able to stick around much, much longer. How many times have we heard about fighters who blow out Achilles or blow out you know knee ligaments galore, and they're out indefinitely? Come back in like eight months, nine months. That never used to happen. It was simply the death knell of an athlete if they blew out certain tendons on their body. The elbows, the knee, the Achilles simply meant like, yo, your career is now pretty much in the toilet. It's circling the drain and it will be in this decaying orbit until you rightfully decide to hit the flapper and flush that whole thing away. Like pull the plug and just flush it away which is an ego trip, right? Strength and conditioning, along with this medicine, medicinal kind of recovery and technology advancement in medicine, I should say, has really kept our athletes moving along a lot longer. And that is a beautiful thing too. Also, our wearable tech has helped a lot of athletes, right? As Tom Brady has talked about, as other people have talked about, allowing us to see all kinds of metrics. Some of them are really in depth. And this has allowed us to atomize our fitness down to these very usable metrics so that we can biohack our way to full health, hydration, REM, heart rate variability. All of these things are super important for us and provide advents to our longevity inside of fitness. So good. And last, one thing you will not find on CoachJohanCSCS.com, and you never will find on CoachJohanCSCS.com, and I don't really endorse on CoachJohanCSCS.com, although I don't tell you guys to stay away from, is performance enhancers. <laughs> Now, performance enhancers is such a broad term. We can talk about it being sub. uh, Well, we can talk about it being banned if you're making money doing the thing like playing a ball sport, competing, fighting, grappling, whatever, cycling. There's some that are banned. There's some that are not banned. But there is this perceivable notion that if you're taking some kind of substance that you're cheating. And I just think that's silly. It's silly. For a number of reasons. And let me say, I'm not going to go through the thousands of reasons, not thousands, but dozens of reasons why the idea that taking some kind of performance enhancer is cheating. There's two reasons off top. I'll leave you guys. I'll be parsimonious and I'll leave you guys to figure out the nuance of this. Number one, nobody's built the same. There's some people who already won the genetic lottery. Already. They already won the genetic lottery. They already won the genetic lottery. Their body is a performance enhancement. All right? We talk about the football player. What is DK Metcalf? He's, I don't know his stats, but he's got to be like 6'3", 6'4", 205. They measured his body fat at like 3, which just, first off, fire that athletic trainer. He doesn't know how to measure body fat, but let's just say it is like 6. All right? And he's fast. And he's got hand like he won the genetic lottery. You watch someone like Rafael Nadal fly around the court. He's made. He's built to be a tennis player. He's built to do that thing right there. 
and not get hyper injured all the time. These guys do suffer injuries. You watch that and you're like, yeah, supposed to be doing that. You won the genetic lottery. I always think of certain fighters. I think of like Jessica Andrade if, in MMA who is short. I think she's like 5'2", five 5'1". Five we can agree that that's short. Or Demetrius Johnson who's even that small too. 5'3", five, 4'5". And is perfectly, literally, physically balanced, perfect for fighting. Can punch and kick, can grapple, can be on the ground standing up, is athletic, fast, has all the attributes filled out. Not too slow, not too fast, not doesn't have exceptional reflexes, but has way better than average. Very strong, and but not overly powerful, but knows how to sustain. You won the genetic lottery. And if that's the case... You're just a walking performance enhancer yourself. One thing we have to do, we have to take time to consider when we think about our professional athletes. It's like, yo, a lot of them are taking something to keep them in the game longer. The other point that I will make about this is, do you guys understand how many people feel at least at the amateur level, that they could be professional and get paid to do the thing. Now, the thing could be something that requires, it has to be something that requires endurance or muscle development and hypertrophy, okay? You can make the argument that playing professional, is there even professional badminton? Maybe there, it probably is. Professional pool, something like that, doesn't require a ton of that recovery, whatever, but we can work on our reflexes. So maybe those performance enhancers are a little bit different. Okay. But if you are looking to make professional money, playing a sport, being physically active, maybe you're on a psych, maybe you become a professional sponsored for running or cycling or doing an obstacle course race, whatever it might be. There are people in the amateur level who have dreams of taking it professional who take performance enhancers and still never make it. And then still, there are people who do make it and never, ever achieve anything above a mid-level of accomplishment who still take performance enhancers. So performance enhancers unequivocally mean that there's cheating, that people who take them are somehow better equipped for the rigors of sport and activity why do bench warmers still take them unless everybody (laughs) anyway we have to take a look at that and we have to understand that this has a little bit of an inroad into why our athletes are sticking around a lot longer how much of these substances should be banned is totally arbitrary what substances should be banned almost exceptionally arbitrary. Whether we decide which ones are safe and unsafe, universally arbitrary. It is a lot of propaganda. Um, almost said propagandizing. I don't think that's a word, but it is. A th- it's an idea where like, yo, I just badmouth this type of drug because this type of person used it to have this type of effect and whatever, whatever. It is definitely the type of thing that is just kind of bad-mouthed for the sake of being bad-mouthed. I don't think it's ever going to be let allowed to run rampant and free as well as it really should be, but our athletes do it. Our athletes are allowed to stick around a lot longer, and it's a shame that they're forced to kind of lie and to get around tests with masking and just sheer mistruths. People should be allowed to demonstrate any level of proficiency in sport by performing the sport at its naked level rather than have to be held to some unreachable standard because I say that you took too much albuterol before you started your race, which, by the way, could be a performance enhancer too. So if you have asthma, maybe it's not so bad, I guess. If you're competing at something. But these are the four reasons that we are able to stick around a lot longer. 
some people will also going back so you know we supplements are supplements kind of performance enhancers they are in a lot of ways do you guys take supplements let me know in the comments and which ones do you take I've heard people ask me recently about the efficacy of of creatine and we already know what that does coming off and what it can do to help you out and i have some pdfs right there on the website coach johanscscs.com where i break down all types of protein and videos about that on the website right there that can help you guys decide what you do want to take and then i do go into supplements on one of my courses about nutrition coaching on the website coach johanscscs.com you can go ahead and get that too and i'll help you break that down a little bit supplements aren't one thing I've always kind of advocated for, let me just share this. You can pretty much find a lot of what you're looking for in supplements in nature. Not everything. <laughs> like if you want to get some creatine, you're going to be eating a lot of beef tartare, right? Because you want that raw. You want that in your in five grams raw. That's pretty hard to do in, in, in natural life. So you actually have to take certain supplements if you want to get that load. But what are we looking for if we're looking for that type of gain? Are we looking for improvements in power? Are we looking for just strength? We also need to consider that. We need to consider how we're going to get it exogenously. And I just mean outside of supplements in our food. And then we can go from there and figure out what you guys need. You can also just ask me straight up on the website, coachingoncscs.com. But there's a lot of ways. There's a lot of ways. We understand that certain amino acids, for example, do synthesize or help you synthesize creatine in your body. And maybe it's just a matter of getting those tryptophan methionines up in your bloodstream by eating that seaweed, that spirulina, for example, those pumpkin seeds or whatever it might be that can also help you. So there's a lot of ways for us to think about it, but you guys think about it, too. Let me know what you guys think. What's your opinion about this? Why are our athletes sticking around a lot longer? Past 40, right? Sanchai fighting, you know, his 9,000th fight at 41, 42. Wars like Liam Harrison, this man's fighting at 40. Nikki Holskin fighting at 40. All of these fighters, you know, Masvidal and Diaz at 40, 41. Um, Stipe Miocic. 40 holly Holm just got done fighting and she's had a ton of fights in her 40s i'd be unbelievably surprised if she was under 42 still competing not retiring i love it i love it and not only that being super productive at the same time like not just phoning it in you know what i mean i don't watch basketball a ton anymore but watching someone like um uh does Chris Paul still ball out or LeBron still over here doing it? And it's like, yo, how are they this good still? Well, it's because they decided to be good. They decided they didn't want to stick around a really long time. They decided that that strength and conditioning has got to be on 10 so that the recovery matters. So you get mad at load management, but that actually helps people stick around a little bit longer. They periodize, they bake it in. Some of the surgeries that these men and women have had, they gave them the good recovery time. They gave them the good cucumbers to put on their eyes' lids right there to help them chill out. And then it's a matter of those performance enhancers. Which ones are being taken? How much? And, hey, I just say just let, let them take what they need to take to sustain their health inside of the physical form. As long as they're not jeopardizing other people's health. All right. There's so much I could say about PEDs in this case, but it is never going to be fully adjudicated because there's just too much money to be made, frankly, by keeping these guys, these men and women, these athletes from performing um, with performance enhancers. So to wrap, yo, let's stick around for each other. Adopt this starting today with the mindset. Make a decision to stick around for a really long time physically. Make that decision and you can find the actions after that. And then anything else that you guys need to know, you can find it on the website, coachyohancscs.com. Start this week off on 10, my friends. Even if by the end of the week you're only at a 9, you're still killing it. Stay all the way up. <laughs>